that's going a bit too far. Good evening and welcome everyone, both those assembled in our Beit Knesset and those watching on the live stream. Very nearly since the inception of Temple Beth Israel, this synagogue community have been champions for both the people and the state of Israel. For me, Israel has always been a given, kimuvan, a part of the wallpaper of my life. Ever since I was encouraged to drop coins in the JNF blue box or to attend an annual walkathon through the streets of my hometown in Cleveland, Ohio, in support of the State of Israel. The year in Israel, which Jocelyn and I spent together between 1983 and 1984, cemented our mutual love for and our relationship to the Jewish state. Tonight, as you will hear from our guest, the vision of its founders is being challenged, and Israel stands at a crossroad. As we begin tonight, I would like to remind each of us what is written in the seminal document, Israel's Declaration of Independence. The state of Israel will foster the development of the country for the benefit of all its inhabitants. It will be based on freedom, justice, and peace as envisioned by the prophets of Israel. It will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. It will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, language, education, and culture. Perhaps you may wish to keep these words in mind as we hear so much more from Israel's streets, from one of its great defenders. I'd like now to call upon my friend Sandy Benjamin, representing our Board of Governance, to deliver a welcome to country. Thank you, Rabbi. On behalf of the Board of Temple Beth Israel, may I start by saying, Leslie, thank you. Thank you for honouring us this evening. We're all very much looking forward to listening to you at this unbelievably important moment in Israel's history. To all of you, members of TBI and friends, thank you for joining us tonight and welcome. Temple Beth Israel acknowledges that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are the first peoples of Australia. The Banyarong people of the Kulin Nation are the traditional owners of the land on which our synagogue is located, for which they have never ceded sovereignty. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this evening. Um, we're doing a flip on last night, Leslie, where we had a, a duo working of Philip introducing and me doing the final pitch. Uh, but it was decided tonight, Philip's probably a little bit better at a final pitch in a bigger crowd than me. So I said, I'll do the introduction, he can do the flip. Um, but tonight we're honoured to have with us Leslie Sachs, an Israeli socialist, a social activist, artist and leader of battles for gender equality and religious freedom. She has served as the CEO for the Israel Women's, Net, Israel Women's Network, Israel Religious Action Centre, the World Union for Progressive Judaism and Women of the Wall. 
She is now Vice Chair of the Israeli Movement for Progressive Judaism. Since first meeting Leslie, I've been in awe of the clarity of her thought and her enormous capacity for inspirational leadership. And we even discovered last night that amongst us we have a lady who unfortunately has been in jail. She hasn't escaped jail just to come to Australia, as she will tell you in her story. We've supported her in all her actions, including those who are in jail. Could you please wake her? Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Leslie Sachs. Thank you. Dear friends, it is my pleasure to address you all, even in light of the current situation threatening our beloved Jewish and democratic homeland, the State of Israel. The Australian progressive Jewish community has always been great supporters for a pluralistic and democratic state. In the Knesset, we are fighting the dramatic changes being proposed by the new government. These changes threaten the check and balances that are a necessary part of all democracies. We continue to turn to you today, knowing that you are among our strongest supporters and donors. We face a real regression in all that we hold dear in Israel, including funding for our communities, rabbis, educational and civil action efforts through the IMPJ and IRAC are under direct threat. Due to the anti-progressive views of some elements in the new government and its ministers, the Israel Movement for Reform and Progressive Movement stands to lose more than 1.5 million US dollars in government funding. These programs provide critical support for rabbis and congregational activities, educational and humanitarian programs, and assistance to new immigrants including many from Ukraine and Russia, as well as the legal and public advocacy work of Iraq. I do not believe I am overstating this situation when I say we need your support now more than ever. This is not just about saving Israeli democracy. We know it is also about saving Israeli Judaism and the character of Zionism. In my years leading the IMPJ, and now serving in the Knesset, I always felt that I was working not only for change in Israel, but representing the Jews of the diaspora and being your voice in Israel's civil society and in our parliament. Israel is the nation of the all Jewish people and must have room for all attitudes and streams of Judaism. I think you would agree with me in seeing that our values, our Judaism, our Masoret, drive me to do what I do. And we share the same vision for Israel. So I'm asking you to do what you do. Support the IMPJ in Iraq at this critical time. Spread the word, advocate, stand for Israel in any ways you can. Again? There we are. So I will, all right. Every Saturday night, like clockwork, I join 500,000 plus fellow Israelis as we take to the streets. For the past 12 weeks, we've been gathering to participate in mass rallies, calling the government to stop the judicial overall, which threatens Israel's existence and, and, uh, and Israel as a democratic country. I stay close to home in Tel Aviv, which week after week draws a large crowd. 
This last Shabbat, before I came here, we were 200,000 people rallying together in Tel Aviv. I'm on several WhatsApp groups um, connected to the Uprise, and last week I counted and discovered that every Saturday evening, over 100 rallies take place all over Israel, um, and in each one of the rallies, the reform movement holds a havdalah beforehand. We bring a different Jewish voice to what's happening uh, in Israel, and we want to bring light into the darkness. Um, a, on, on the 18th of February, I joined something called the Handmaid's March. Let me just uh, make sure where... Oh, okay, the Handmaid's March. Um, and um, some of you uh, might know the dystopian book by Margaret Atwood, in which uh, it, she shows a world that takes place in the future against the background of a theocratic totalitarian society. This society recruits fertile women called handmaids into childbearing slavery, where they're raped, impregnated, and then the babies are taken away from them. So what we do in the Handmaid's March in Israel is we dress up in a red cloak, like the handmaids, and we wear this white cap with a brim, as you can see. You cannot see anything except for the feet of the woman in front of you. And we march. We march and we're led by other people because you can't see anything where you're marching. It is a truly scary, a, a scary uh, thing to do. Um, but what we want to say is we want to bring home to Israelis that this future that they are planning for us, the government is planning for us, is going to harm women in so many ways. And I'm going to be talking a, a, about, a little bit about it um, during this presentation. Now, um, it takes a lot to rattle me. As the executive director of Women of the Wall, I was arrested several times. I've been interrogated and been, been fingerprinted. Mugshots were taken. The police brought charges against me and took me to court. There I was tried and acquitted with a precedent-setting ruling which led to the establishment of the pluralistic plaza at the Western Wall. Today, members of the new government threaten to override Israelis' core values. They want to replace those values with insidious racism, extremism, and discrimination. We've already encountered a barrage of legislation uh, endangering our movement's legal achievements, and I'll be talking a bit more about that in the, in, in the, uh, further on. Now, um, the Israeli reform movement stands in the forefront of this battle against uh, the judicial overall. And a multiple, multitude of, uh, of legislation, uh, legislative in, 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 initiatives that are already being proposed by the new government. The court has always been the movement's iron dome. It has protected, protected our liberty and our rights as the reform movement and other civil rights of other organizations in the civil society. Because Israel has no separation between state and religion, you all know that, and since the only Judaism recognized in Israel is orthodoxy, the reform movement has had to fight in the courts for every step of the way and for every achievement that we have been able to get. Um, this government, okay, this government is the most religious in the nation's 74 years of existence. Five of the six parties are religious by definition. Two of them are ultra-Orthodox, Shas and Yadut Torah, and three are religious Zionist, meaning they combine rigid, rigid orthodoxy with ultra-nationalism. The, the government is overwhelmingly male, Orthodox and Haredi, totally religiously halachic conservative, and the coalition agreement, which was made in order to form 
this government, the coalition agreement with the Likud, has so many legislative proposals which aim to turn Israel in so many ways into a theocracy. Now, we talk a lot about the override court cause and the damage to the Supreme Court. So I'm not going to talk so much about that because we read a lot, a lot about it. What I want to talk about more is I want to focus on several legislative and policy proposals which could potentially harm our movement and the values that we all share. One of them is the Ministry of Education. The Ministry of Education intends to prohibit our involvement with Jewish liberal curriculum in the school system, as well as any other content, content pertaining to human rights or LGBTQ rights. We will not be able to enter the school system without, uh, with our curriculum. The next subject I want to talk about briefly is the Western Wall. Now, again, I'm not going to go into the whole history of the Battle of Women of the Wall, but I'll just say that at the moment the situation is um, there is a pluralistic plaza. It looks like the back of the bus. It really uh, does not, is not a place that you feel in awe or feel at all that you want to worship on this wooden platform where you can't even put chairs because it's not stable enough. That is what they have given us. This is a second-rate pl uh, place to pray for second-rate Jews. Now, women of the wall continue praying in the women's section because we know that as long as we are there, and they don't want us there, and they harass us every month, as long as we are there, something might happen to move things along with the pluralistic plaza. The only reason today that women of the wall are not being arrested is because of a ruling in the court after my fourth arrest, where the judge ruled that the custom of the Western Wall, the custom of the place, has not been ever defined. And since at the time of the, of the, of the ruling, women of the wall had been there for 24 years, now we've been there for 34 years, um, we were also the custom of the place. There is new legislation that will be passed very soon. The reason we know it is because it is part of the coalition agreement. And this new legislation, which is led in this case by Yahadut HaTorah, says that the custom of the place at the Western Wall will be defined as the custom of the chief rabbinate, which means up to six months imprisonment for everybody who doesn't pray according to the way that the chief rabbinate wants, and very possibly egalitarian prayer at the pluralistic plaza might be forbidden as well. So for sure, women of the wall will, will go to prison because we will, and we don't know yet what's going to happen to the pluralistic plaza. Let me just uh, make sure that we're running along with the... Okay. This is the Western Wall, some of my arrests. You can see behind. Um, there are two legislative proposals which, which are in the pipeline at the moment, and I think many of you have heard about them, um, which will affect Jews in the diaspora. The first is conversion. Okay? In, in 2021, after 15 years in court, the state of Israel was forced to recognize by court, was forced to recognize reform and conservative uh, conversion in Israel for the purpose of citizenship. Um, our movement converts between 300 and 400 people now every year, and the numbers are growing all the time because unlike the uh, ultra-Orthodox conversion or Orthodox conversion, we do not uh, expect the family to uh, keep kashrut, to send the children to religious schools. They do study for a full year, and they do belong to our congregations, and they have to go through an examination with the Bet Din, but they prefer to come to us, and the numbers are growing. There is a new law in the pipeline, 
which will define that, uh, that there will, will only be state conversion. Again, chief rabbinate driven, and our conversions will, might not be, will probably not be recognized in Israel. And I can't tell you for sure what will happen with, with the liberal conversions from, uh, from outside Israel. We, we don't know yet. The second clause that will probably uh, affect all Jews living outside Israel is a change in the law of return. Today, there is something called the grandchild's, grandchild's clause. And a grandchild of a grandfather who is Jewish, but the grandmother was not Jewish. And of course, the same goes with a child of a Jewish father where the mother isn't Jewish. They can come and live in Israel. They are recognized um, by, um, by the law of return. This is to be changed, meaning that this could affect grandchildren of people who are here, great-grandchildren, and this is a great worry and, and should worry all of us because Israel is a place that we would like our descendants, whether they are considered Jewish by halakha or not, to be at home, to be welcome. And this is to change in the near future. Um, as Gilad said, uh, this is our conversions, some of our conversions. And as Gilad uh, mentioned beforehand, um, some of the um, legislation and definitely some of the ministers intend to harm us financially. It has taken us years, I'll, I'll say something beforehand, um, Orthodox synagogues, Orthodox rabbis, a lot of their activity is funded by the state. Unlike other countries, because we have no separation between state and, and, and religion, it's funded by the state. We fight through the courts, and we have to for many years, to get funding for equal activity. And usually, we win. And we, we stand to lose approximately 1.5 million uh, Australian dollars, which is about 10% of the IMPJ's budget because of the new government and the changes that are going to ha happen. Now, the Israel Religious Action Center, uh, IRAC, is the legal and advocacy arm of the reform movement. IRAC has been fighting not only to, for our rights as a, as a movement, but also for the values that we, we hold. And um, one of the um, battles I want to refer to is connected to another change that is going to be in the new, new barrage of legislation. And this is the, the separated buses. So what happened was that the National Bus Service in Israel started, uh, was allowing a separation between women and men in the buses in certain neighborhoods. The women had to go to the back. These were mainly buses that drove through ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods. The women were sent to the back of the bus. The men were in the front of the bus. The Israel Religious Action Center took the Minister of Transport to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled against him, against these buses, and the, the, the ceased. Every time you go into a bus in Israel now, there is a big sign that says, anyone can sit anywhere in this bus. Okay, now the reason we won this court case was based on a law that, um, that prevents discrimination in giving services. A shop owner, for instance, cannot decide, oh, I'm not giving an Ethiopian service or an Arab or a woman or a Reformed Jew. This is illegal. This is to be changed. And why is it to be changed? Because the ultra-Orthodox party, parties want segregation. They would like, and they've been trying to segregate many different things, but unsuccessfully as with the buses. So they want to segregate, for instance, uh, swimming pools, days for men, hours for women, um, the sick funds. Um, 
also even public public events in the in the in the general you know sphere in the in the town hall anyway they will be able to say no women singers because we don't want to hear women's voices uh, women on this side men on this side and and this is something that will we won't be able to fight another another thing that we've managed to uh, to achieve again through the iraq is the right of women to say kaddish in our cemeteries and funeral houses and again this was a battle i can uh, tell you firsthand that a very good friend of mine uh, lost her mother and she has just recently and she and her sister in rehovot um you know wanted to say kaddish they were the only daughters and the rabbi in charge there um wouldn't let them he he really disrupted the the funeral service and she was, i came to see her during the shiva and she told me and i said uh, lia you you need to you need to go to iraq we 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 need to sue them she said no it's already been you know it's got i said you need to do it for women in the future for others so that they won't go through what you have gone through and indeed she did iraq represented them and they got compensation and this will never happen again there with that khavre kadisha in that cemetery so again what will happen when the law is changed that this we won't be able to fight it in any way because legally we won't have a standing to fight it i'm not sure that the courts will have so much uh, so many the, the courts themselves will be strong enough but even if they were we we wouldn't have grounds to to fight this sorry so last friday i met with my dear friend gilad kariv gilad who led the movement for 10 years as the ceo is a lawyer and a rabbi and a brilliant fearless fearless member of Knesset. He's emerging as one of the strong new leaders in Israel. In one of the recent demonstrations, as you can see, we held this poll, I'm on the left, he's in the middle, and the exec- new executive director of the reform movement is on the other side. And as we were marching down and 200,000 people were you know moving aside so that we could march with this big sign and clapping i heard people who don't belong to to our movement saying to each other is that gilad kariv is that the member of knesset gilad kariv carry on what you're doing you know fight for us don't stop fighting for us so i see gilad as 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 a hope for the future both representing our movement and you know fighting for the values that we all believe in and you heard him saying that he's always believed that he fights for all Jews you know both in outside Israel and and Israel majority of israelis the majority of israelis um polls show that it's over 50% some of whom actually voted for this government do not support the elimination of the rule of law in Israel My friends never before in Israel's 74 years of existence has have so many Israelis come out to demonstrate for democracy hundreds and thousands leave their comfort zone pick up their banners their hallowed israeli flag and join this epic battle for democracy and the rule of law it started off with a demonstration in tel aviv which i attended in pouring rain and we were about 50,000 people um and i thought this was wonderful it was amazing and now we're half a million half a million people every saturday night going out to demonstrate in more as uh, than 100 places this morning not this morning just a few hours ago when israel's morning started i started seeing what up whatsapps started seeing pictures israelis today are blocking all the roads the main roads the highways israelis are out there to stop what is happening and these are people who've never been in a demonstration in their lives even from my family you know i was the one who was always out demonstrating everybody felt they didn't need to do anything they are out 
everybody goes out to demonstrate, and it is the majority. I want to share with you that this last the Saturday evening before I came to Australia, I was in Tel Aviv, and on the main, uh, main podium spoke Limor Livnat. Livnor, Limor Livnat is Likud. She's always been Likud. She's right wing, she's always been Likud. She was a minister of education in Israel, okay? She does not share the values that we share here. But she stood up in front of 200,000 people and she said, what is happening now is unacceptable. And she, sa she said, I'm right wing, I will always vote right wing, but what's happening now, I will fight with you. And she's not alone, there are people um, um, rallying now, uh, people who, who, who are rallying as Likud voters, you know, a thousand here, 500 there, they're rallying also in some of the settlements. So I can tell you that we definitely are a majority and many are willing to do anything to stop what is happening now. We see them in the streets all across Israel high-tech, from the high-tech industry, kibbutzim, architects and city planner, planners, pupils, youth movements, students and lecturers, senior citizens and young families. You see people coming with their children, the children are wrapped in the flag and, and the parents are explaining to them all about democracy. And that is one of the most exciting things in these terrible times because People are talking democracy. What does it mean? What does it mean, you know, to live in a democracy? What are the elements that you can't let go of in order for Israel to remain a democracy? These are discussions that are, were never held before. And also the, story, the, the, the whole um, language and, and idea of... Um, of religious coercion. Again, this is a language that the reform movement has been talking about and using, and the conservative movement, but the public hasn't been involved. And now I feel it's Yomot Mashiach. You know, I'm hearing people, journalists, that have never discussed the issue, are suddenly talking about it. There was a journalist who wrote an op-ed in one of our main newspapers, after this, uh, it came out, uh, this new legislation of six months in prison for praying in the, at the Western Wall. And he said, he wrote, I've never been a supporter of women of the wall. I've never written about them. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a religious person. But today, we are all women of the wall. Now, when you hear that, and when you hear the language, it gives me a lot of hope. It gives me a lot of hope for the future, um, I can tell you that the most recent post that I've been re reading, by, uh, written by Yair Lapid, Yair Lapid is the head of the, the second largest uh, party in Israel. He has tremendous support, and he is talking about a uh, constitution. And the moment he started putting out the issue of the constitution, I've been seeing more and more posts and more and more articles talking about the fact that Israel needs a constitution, that is the next step. After we stop this legislation, the next step is constitution. This is something uh, wonderful. So I, I want to say with all, within all these difficult things that we are facing now and this, this gloom future that we're all worried about, there could be, there could be something good coming out, coming out of it. One of the things that I had said uh, in, a, in a presentation last night is that I feel that at the moment that divide between left, middle, right, left and right, the middle has always be, has for years been uh, called left wing by uh, Netanyahu and his, uh, his government. It's, it's a way of dividing the people into two, you know, anyone who isn't with us is the enemy. But of course, you know this is not true, and most of Israel are in the center. And at the moment, 
the whole um, discourse is not centered around, um, you know, Palestinians, what's going to happen, uh, peace, separation, two states. It's all about the values of democracy. And I believe that when we internalize these values, we as a people, you know, we'll see change there as well. I hope that we will see change. Um, now, we might not be able to stop the judicial overall. It's running forward. You know, um, there are several discussions about a compromise. I know you all uh, have been hearing about it. But um, as, as I, I read a post this morning of Gilad Kariv, who's in the Knesset, and he said, you know, the coalition's not interested in it. There's no one to talk to. You can't even talk about a compromise because there's no one to discuss it with. They are moving ahead like, like a train that's moving ahead into collision. And, and so there's no point in even talking about a compromise because you have no one to compromise with because they're not willing to stop and say, okay, we're going to stop so that we can talk and come to wide agreements. And I'm sure that I won't be happy with a compromise and they won't be happy with a compromise, but that's a good compromise when no one feels that they've, they've gotten everything they want, but everyone can live with it one way or another. But that's not going to happen. Not the way things are going at the moment. Um, Last Shabbat, I asked uh, at the demonstration, I asked my dear friend, uh, Rabbi Nir Balkin, who is the rabbi in Yozma, in Modi'in. I said to him, you know, I'm going to Australia. What do you think the main message should be? And he thought a minute, and he said, tell them they can be proud of us, that we are fighting for all of us, that we, but we also need their support. And I think that there, if there's one message that I've been trying to convey uh, during my presentations, both in Sydney and here, is exactly that. We are there fighting for all of us. There is hope. There is, there's always hope. I mean, we can't be activists if we don't believe that the future can be different and that we need you to be behind us, to support us in every way. Um, again, I'll go back to my famous WhatsApp groups. I received a WhatsApp group with all the cities in the world where people are demonstrating against the government, against the judicial overall. And there are many, many of them, and there's a link. So any of you who's going to Paris or to London or anywhere abroad and wants to participate, just tell me. And I also know that there are demonstrations here in Australia. Um, an important way to support us also is to write write to the newspaper, write to politicians, write to politicians here, write to politicians in Israel. Uh, you know, I know that the, uh, the reform movement uh, and, and other movements put out a proclamation here, which was very, very important, uh, talking about the, the great worry that the Jewish community, which is a very, very supportive and loving community, has at the moment, those those. Uh, worries that they have about what's happening in Israel. I think that is very important. Um, let me just see where, where we go with these. The, these, are, these are pictures of the different rallies on the Saturday nights and the Havdalot that the reform movement holds all over Israel. At last, but certainly not least, please help us fight the darkness and help us increase the light by generously supporting the progressive, uh, uh, the progressive appeal. And I hope that any of you who comes to Israel will come and visit us in one of our 64 congregations. We would love to have you. And, and it's so good to meet you all and to be here. And I hope to meet you all again soon. Thank you. As usual, amazing. Thank you, Leslie. Before we carry on, I just want to mention that if you want to hear more of Leslie, she'll be speaking at Etz Chaim on Shabbat morning. And on the 31st of 
uh, at the end of March, the Friday, which I think is the 31st, she'll be speaking at the Leo Beck Centre, uh, more on speaking about minorities and, and women in Israel. So you've got two more opportunities. And, oh, well, yes, I thought everybody knew that. <laughs> Uh, but yes, of course, she's here tomorrow night. Um, we will have a little question session. So if anybody has a, a question, uh, Brian. Oh. Thank you. Um, Leslie, two points I, I just wanted to raise, which we might be able to elaborate on. <laughs> Number one is um, I understand that with all of these laws in Israel, the final step is that the president has to sign them off as being law. If the president refuses, what happens next? That's number one. Number two, I do understand that um, Gillard and others are working on trying to have maybe a handful of members of parliament support a no confidence motion because Netanyahu only has a very slim majority of whatever it is, 61 or whatever it is. If he can get five, that could be, and it could give us a scenario, what would happen if that occurs, please, please goodness. Okay, I'll start with the second one. Um, uh, Netanyahu has a coalition of 64 out of 120. So we are trying to, uh, we, I'm, I'm translating directly from Hebrew, work on we're trying to persuade or, but, or influence um, at least four, if not five, members of the Likud. Now, I, I, want to, I want to go back a minute to that uh, picture that you saw with the, uh, with the different um, parties. Um, the Likud doesn't really have any interest in turning Israel into a theocracy. This is not their thing. In many ways, they are shackled and led by the other five parties. Because if they don't go with them on what those parties want, then the coalition will fall. Netanyahu does what, want a judicial overall for his personal... Uh, I don't have to go into that. We all know, you know, he doesn't want to go to court. And if he goes to court, he can go to prison for many, many years, many, many years. He is, in, he is uh, charged with, with, with several char serious charges of, uh, of embezzlement. I mean, I'm talking about many years. So of course, he is trying to uh, organize a golden parachute and let the plane crash. But not everybody in the Likud feels that way. So we are trying to reach several members of the Likud who are smart people, who are caring people. They care not, about, not only about their own personal political career, but they care about Israel and they see what is happening. So that is one of the possibilities. And people say to me, what's going to happen in the future? And I say, you know, um, you, the, the prophecy is given to the fools. I, I don't know, but I can, I can draw several scenarios that could happen. So that's one of them, that we could try and sway some of these uh, members of, of, of the Likud to maybe vote against it, maybe split. God, God, please be with us on this. Um, another option is that, and this will probably happen, the moment the laws pass, they will, some, they will be appealed in the Supreme Court. And when the Supreme Court most probably doesn't ratify them or doesn't, uh, you know, gives a verdict against them, we will have a, a, a crisis. You know, I don't know what will happen. And there's another step which you mentioned, and that is the President of Israel needs to sign every new law. Now, this has happened for 74 years. There's not been one, war, one law that hasn't been automatically signed by him. What happens if he doesn't sign the laws? So these are big questions, and even, you know, the most renowned, uh, um, uh, you know, people, professors of law in Israel, 
I don't know exactly what, what the result will be. But beside all that, what's happening in the streets is huge. And there's another, uh, I'm going to touch before we move to the next question, and something else that's happening that's really important to be aware of. And that is what is happening with the IDF reservists. The IDF reservists, men and women, who go every year for 45 days to do their, their army duty, they're saying we won't go anymore. We will not go anymore. And I'm talking about, about intelligence for a core, the intelligence core. Now, this is serious stuff. They have to, we need them. They have to go. They have knowledge that the young soldiers don't have. And they're saying, we will not serve a country that is not a democracy. The pilots, the Israeli Air Force pilots, have been getting together to say, we're not going to do our, our, our reserve duty. My uh, niece's husband is here, and he, he was in the army, and he did many days every year of reserve duty in, in a, a very senior position, important position. People like him are saying, we will not go. No more. Now, this is a big uh, leverage. And these five members of the Likud that I was talking about, uh, some of them are ex-army people, you know, who've, who've kind of moved from senior positions into, into politics. So this, again, could be in our favor. Sandy. Thanks, Gary. Leslie, have you identified who are the possible five? Oh, yeah, okay, that's one. My other question, when you talk about an appeal, if the law passes, there will be an appeal. Who can appeal it? Oh, anyone, basically you can go to court, anyone can go to court. I can, I, I can name at least 20 organisations that will appeal, appeal the law. It could be that members of Knesset from the opposition will, will appeal to the Supreme Court. The way the judicial system works in Israel today, um, basically, and, and this is the wonderful thing about our legal system, and this is what protects the civilians' um, rights, is the possibility for anyone to appeal to the Supreme Court basically on anything. If it's not relevant, he will be, they will be denied. But so many, I was involved in so many cases that the organization that I worked for, whether it was IRAC, in the Israel Women's Network, we appealed in the name of a young woman who wanted to be a pilot called Alice Miller. And thanks to that appeal, the whole IDF opened up for women. All positions in the IDF were open to women as a result of this young woman who came to a women's organization and we represented her. So this is the route to bring change. But in this case, I, I have no idea what will happen. Yeah, there's a gentleman over there with a the, with the hat. Hmm? <laughs> yes, but you're on Zoom. You need to be on Zoom as well. Uh, hi, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my question is, these changes that are currently on the books, were they um, presented when the government was being elected? Because in, in Australia, part of the protest would be against the broken promise, let alone the actual pr uh, uh, protest of the rules. So I'm wondering if that was presented, and is, does that come into part of the protesting? So um, it's a mixed answer. Some of it was, but if you voted for the Likud, for instance, you didn't think, oh, what's, what's, what's in the books of, uh, of uh, Noam? Be because when you went to the ballot, you voted for the Likud and you didn't say, okay, they, they're going to be shackled to Noam, which has a right homophobic, um, anti-women, anti-feminist uh, agenda. You, you don't really think about it when you go to vote for the party that you're voting for. I think that um, most people don't really understand politics that deeply and the discussion in the public sphere, in the media, about what's going to happen with the Supreme Court or the courts in general, 
what's it wasn't discussed in the way that it's discussed now there is so much education going on in Israel now you can't but not be more informed than you were before you went it you went it to vote i know of uh, of young women who voted for bengvir now they voted for bengvir because uh, they're they're scared, scared of the palestinians they're scared of terrorist attacks they never gave a thought to where he stands as far as their rights as women they never they never thought about it one of them i even know her brother said to her how can you vote for him he's he's lgbtq he said how can you vote for him he's going to do everything he can to harm my my rights and so she didn't vote for the one she wanted to vote for but again most people you know um know okay likud is the good guys everybody else is the bad guys that's how things have been um uh, spoken about and presented for so long that i don't think that that voters really knew what they were many of them was voting for and that is why there's such a majority now that says oh you know this is not what i wanted even though i voted likud this is not what i wanted saying that i think that most of the people who voted for the other um religious parties and most of them don't have that many mandates you know uh, noam has uh, one and i mean we're talking six at the most six seven but the likud has the majority um their people would probably vote for them again they they knew what they were they were getting and some of them are happy with what's happening um that was part of my question did um those who voted for likud know who netanyahu was going to go to bed with and my fear is i know i'm not so young but i remember iran and the changes that happened there and how women were the intellectuals in the universities and now two generations later there's no one to teach the girls and this is really i have family in israel but that is really scaring me that mm -hmm. above all else is israel going backwards yeah and a shade who doesn't look good on me yeah no no you you you're absolutely right and and we should we should be we should be worried about uh, what is happening um one of the things i didn't go go into and i'm just going to mention it again something that that's going to be very harmful for women um the the batay din okay today in israel by law you can only go in to the bed din on issues of marriage and divorce and settlement uh, settle uh, financial settlements uh, concerning the marriage and divorce any other subject you have to go to the civil courts okay i'm reminding us the people who are sit as the dayanim as the judges in the uh, uh, batay din are all men they haven't studied law they've studied halakha and most of them uh, don't know much about the secular world they don't know that much about women they know their mothers their sisters their wives that maybe their daughters they have no interaction with other women and the legislation now again one of the things that's going to pass is going to allow them to um to deal with many more issues many more subjects so for instance if um if i'm working in a company and i have a dispute with uh, whoever's employing me he can go to the bed din now if i go to the bed din i'm <laughs> i'm in a bad way because i'm starting off in 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 a place where my testimony my testimony can't be accepted because women's testimony in the bed din is not valid and and so you can imagine what that for instance is going to mean is going to mean for women and there's so many different areas where women are going to going to be harmed and that is the reason that i showed you the handmaid's march 
which is happening now all over Israel. There was this one march with a thousand women, and it is so powerful, you know, to see it, and it, it, it brings forward a message that is later also discussed. So why are they there? What does it mean? And people are talking about it more and more. So, you know, we're getting through that, that message of, of, of a great worry. And, and if I might also say another word, not, not necessarily about women, but about, you were talking about Iran. And we look both at Iran and we also look at what happened um, in Hungary, same kind of thing. And one of the things now that, uh, that um, the Minister of Education is trying to do is he wants to take over the National Library. He wants to appoint, personally, whoever's going to be in charge of the National Library. That is very problematic, to say the least. And I just read this morning that the same thing goes now with the person who's in charge of the National Bureau of Statistics. That the minister, I'm not, I don't remember which one, said that no... Um, no new personnel will be permitted to be taken into work in the National Bureau of Statistics until they get the, um, uh, uh, they, it is approved that the minister will be able to ap appoint whoever stands at the top of the National Bureau of Statistics. I don't need to tell you what that means. We know what the future will look, look like if this happens. Thank you. Hi. Um, Leslie. I was thinking, I mean, you've described so beautifully all the different um, groups who uh, are in danger. I was thinking about Israeli Palestinians. Sorry? The Israeli Palestinians. Oh, yeah. They came to mind. So if Netanyahu and Likud, never mind these extreme right wingers um, who are, you know, ultra orthodox, but even under Likud, and he's not even religious can vanquish his own Jewish people to this degree and, you know, vanquish them into submission, as he's shown he can, um, Palestinian Israelis are in grave danger. So my first question is really, um, are they mixed in whether they should join the march or not? And what is the Jewish consensus or not on including Arab, uh, Arab Israelis or Palestinian Israelis. And then while you were talking, another group came to mind, and that is academia. Mm. Since 2010, particularly in 2015, groups like Imtutur's attack on academia in vile ways under Likud, mm. under Likud, under Bibi, sanctioning them, attacking academics in the university in the most horrific ways, calling them traitors, infiltrators, moles. I mean, academic institutions are under grave attack as well, aren't they? So yes. I'm really looking at those two branches, even though all of this has been amazing. Like the, It seems like we can keep thinking of other groups that are in grave danger. So I just wondered if you could comment on that. Thank you. I'll start with a comment on the academia and say that, um, of course, they've joined the protests. They are 100% in the protests. Um, Yuval Noah Harari, who's a very well-known thinker, is one of the clear voices saying such important things. And, uh, and we see them and we hear them. You know, in the demonstrations, sometimes you have a, a group marching. So, you know, there's a group of the, both students and lecturers going together. There's a group of... Um, of what we call the white robes. These are people working in the medical professions. We have the black robes, which are the, the lawyers, you know, walking around uh, with the black robes. So we, ha we definitely have a lot of them in, 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 the, pro in the protests. And, and this is, again, one of the subjects that I'm so happy that is discussed. And if I might open brackets here as well and say something uh, that... that has, that worries me very much, and it's been going on for some time, and that is uh, segregated classes in the universities. Um, this is something that um, is happening in most of the universities, 
And I think it is a terrible thing that is happening. Now, the reason that, 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 that the universities, most of them have voted in favor of certain classes to be segregated, mainly for the Haredi uh, pupils, because, I mean, we all want them to be educated and to go out and work. That's an agreement. But the price that women are going to pay, women in the academia for those segregated uh, uh, classes was, let's say that the women were not making those, the, those decisions. It was men that was make, were making the decisions. Because in these classes, a women le lecturer can't lecture. She can't. OK, it's only men lecturers. And what they do is they stand on a, on a table, and they have the women on the one side and the men on the, on the other side. Um, and then the, uh, the pupils I started demanding separate hours in the library at, at the university. So it doesn't end. When, when you start with segregation, it's like with the Western Wall, when you start with silencing of women and segregating, it oozes out to the public sphere. So that's, that's the academia. About the Arab population, so it was interesting, right at the beginning of the demonstrations, I asked a, a friend of mine who heads an Arab Jewish organization, and I said, you know, are they going to join? What's happening with them? And he, he gave me the following explanation, which I am now passing on. He said, firstly, the Supreme Court has never been very helpful to the Palestinians. Never. They've always been, let's say, to the right. Um, and so the Palestinians don't feel... Um, you know, don't feel that they really want to go and, and fight for the Supreme Court. Even though they do know the situation, their situation will be much, wor much worse. But, and the other reason is, you know, I, I, I'm trying to explain to you the, 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 the intensity, the, the excitement, the might of going out to these demonstrations, amongst other things, because everybody is holding, holding the Israeli flag. You, you get 200,000 people, 150,000 have, have the Israeli flag. And we sing the national anthem, either at the beginning of the demonstration or the end of the demonstration. And it is really important because we have reclaimed the flag. And when I say we, I'm talking about, uh, you know, left and middle. Somehow the flag had been, had been claimed by the settlers and we have reclaimed the flag. Anyone, anyone now in Israel who hangs a flag on the balcony, everybody knows they are opposed to the judicial overall. So a Palestinian would feel very uncomfortable in these rallies. And, and we do see in Tel Aviv like in, 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 a, in the side of the rally, there is a group of uh, Israelis and uh, of, of, of Palestinians and, and Israeli Jews, and they do um, rally together, and they have a few Palestinian flags. But you know, it's it's small and it's on the side. No one would feel comfortable in these in these rallies. And you know what? It's okay. I think I think it's fine. I think it's good because there's something else uniting us. And at the moment, the divide, that big divide, is, is not there, even though I cannot, you know, not say something about the terrible um, acts in Khawara, um, you know, and the incitement of this government, uh, you know, uh, encouraging it. Um, this is something that is, of course, un unacceptable. And I can tell you that uh, quite a few of our, our people, our rabbis, went, tried to go the next, next day or the day afterwards to Hawara, and, and they weren't permitted in by the army. So we, we can't not say something about this. Answer. I'm sorry? A Bureau of Statistics. Oh, yeah. So, from a long term perspective, how do you deal with that balance? I mean, this isn't the immediate problem, but it is the what behind the immediate problem is the shift in population. Um, but there's been a push of population to the north of the region, the Israeli population, 
Mm. Um, so, so again, the ultra-Orthodox historically in Israel were not necessarily right-wing. Rabbi Ovadia Yosef was not right-wing as far as the Palestinian issue goes. Um, so I, I, I just think that we need to separate between that issue and the issue of, uh, you know, religious coercion, let's put it under that wide frame. Um, I think that the, the answer and the best answer is, uh, is, um, is a constitution. Only a constitution, a, a constitution that is accepted, that is, you know, will, will in, in the far future, will, in my, my view, really keep Israel a democracy and, and a country that everybody will be able to, to live in. But prophecy, as I said beforehand, is not, uh, is not something that I will indulge in. Can I just um, add to both the last two questions? Uh, I have family in the West Bank. Well, I have family in Israel and you're talking about statistics, uh, they made Aliyah from London, two girls, and then my brother. Uh, from the two girls, they had 15 children. Of the 15 children they have now, and there's still some to get married, uh, 39 great-grandchildren. I was in, Lo I was in uh, northern Israel at an ultra-Orthodox hotel where he'd booked out 23 bedrooms uh, and there were two other simchas going on. This was to celebrate his 60th uh, wedding anniversary and it ranged from Hasidic Jews to settler Jews to ultra-Orthodox Jews and we made an appearance. Um, but the, the story is that from this very small number there's now 74 in the family. When the burning of the village occurred, uh, Rabbi Danny Schiff put on Facebook um, an article totally um, that this was so against Jewish ethics and Jewish morality. And the nicest 24-year-old great-niece of mine who lives in the West Bank uh, said, well, if it's not them, it's us. Uh, and, you know, Uncle, it's not... We didn't mean to kill anyone. We just wanted to burn their village so they'd disappear. And that reverberates in my head all the time because this is the first time in 40 years that we've actually had a political discussion. We've tried to avoid it for 40 years, but this is such a grave situation. Uh, and I was just shocked. We, we didn't mean to kill anyone, we just wanted to burn their village so they'd disappear. And that's a reality. These are the people that are supporting this government. So you've heard the pain You've heard the passion, and you've heard the pessimism. And that's why we need your support tonight. We must have a strong progressive movement in Israel and around the world. The work of the World Union and the IMPJ over many years has achieved huge strides in recognition and strength. We need your support to maintain and continue this growth Make no mistake, at the stroke of a pen, all these successes in Israel can be destroyed by a fanatical, ultra-right, ultra-religious government. In other words, we need strength to battle and avoid an extremist theocracy. This will affect not only our brothers and sisters in Israel, but every other minority group as well. So tonight, please feel generous. Feel that you have done your part to support Jewish democracy in Israel. 
I'd like to thank you, Leslie. That was a tremendous, tremendous presentation. I'd like to thank Edo for your technical assistance, and I'd like to thank Temple Beth Israel for homing this event tonight. Uh, Jocelyn has um, uh, little forms to give out, uh, hoping that uh, we can make and show our support for the IMPJ in Israel. Thank you for your attendance, and uh, we may see you at one of the other events where uh, Leslie is speaking. Thank you.